uh, but I can look at it on the phone. All right. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back to another episode of Opportunity Makers. This time it's personal. It's what I said in the in the program outline. And we're going to be talking about something that really probably is going to affect most of us who are watching and listening this morning. So thank you so much for being here. Before I introduce Deborah Bakhti, I want to take a moment, as I have been lately, uh, to um, acknowledge our first peoples, the keepers and caretakers of this land. And where I live in Muskoka, Ontario, about two hours north of Toronto, in particular, I want to acknowledge the Chippewas of Rama, the Wada Mohawk First Nations, and Moon River, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And this is all a part of honoring our Indigenous history and culture and moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation. So thank you so much for allowing me to do that. And wherever you are, I hope you can take a moment and acknowledge the First Peoples of your beautiful land, wherever that might be. So my guest this morning, Deborah Bakhti. Deborah and I have known each other for, she's going to hate me saying this, about 24 or 25 years already. And our paths have crossed in many different ways over the years. And the work that she's doing now is so needed both for us personally in our lives and for the people who we love the most, most often our parents and uh, the folks who are around us who are in need of care that we can no longer provide. So Deborah, welcome. Thanks Libby, so great to be here. I'm so happy that you could make this happen. Um, your, uh, your history, so you and I met at a conference. We were both becoming coaches back in 1999. Yep. And uh, we sat on a, at a conference table, a panel, talking about uh, coaching in the corporate world in Canada, which basically was non-existent. And uh, I made the big announcement that I was going to quit my job when I went back to the office that day. <laughs> you did not, but you did some remarkable work with the organization that you were working with at that time. And you have gone on to uh, be an executive at Extendicare and was it, is it Paramed is mm -hmm. the sister company. Uh, but you have a very personal story to tell around uh, the impetus for some of the work that you have been doing in the past few years and the books that you have written. So do you want to share with everybody a little bit about that personal story of yours? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So when I joined uh, Extended Care, working as a senior executive there, within probably a year and a half or two years, my husband started having some just really weird health symptoms. And um, it was a long journey to get a diagnosis. He had a very rare disease. We went through like 27 different specialists and four different hospitals. It was just crazy time. And um, it became apparent when he got diagnosed with this really rare disease that we'd no longer be able to take care of him at home. At the time he got sick, our kids were 11 and 17. I was working full time, commuting an hour each way. And he just continued to get worse and worse. So working with the, what they were called the CCAC at the time in Ontario, needed to make the decision to move Ty into long-term care. Mm -hmm. And the, the really kind of a weird circumstance was that a few months earlier, my dad, because he had Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia, my mom could no longer take care of him. We had to move my dad into long-term care. So my dad had been living in long-term care in one uh, nursing home in Burlington on one side of the city. And we were moving my husband into another long-term care home on the other side of the city. Wow. And Ty lived in long-term care for four years. He passed away in 2015. And then my third experience being a family member was with my mom and we needed to help her make the decision to move into independent living a couple of years after my dad passed away. And then uh, she started developing uh, symptoms around dementia. And so then we needed to move her into assisted living and she passed away in 2019. So I've got this 
experience of having been a family member of three different occasions, mom, mm -hmm. dad, husband. And I worked in seniors care for 11 years. I understood the business. Yeah. And so it was at the end of 2017 that I made the decision to leave my corporate job and start my own company, uh, which I've been running for the last six years, because I wanted to have more of an impact with the direct care providers, the direct care staff working in uh, seniors care, as well as their leadership in the home mm -hmm. and the families. Yeah. Because it's that really key relationship when when those two come together. And that's really what I've been able to do over the last six years with education and workshops and training and consulting and also going in and helping homes to redesign the admission process because well, that, that's a whole conversation for another day. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I, I too have, have my uh, exper personal experience with long-term care. I mean, you know, when I was younger, we had elderly aunts and uncles and that kind of thing. But my mom had a stroke 10 years ago that left her left side debilitated. And it was an interesting journey finding something that was close to where my sisters and I were. But also it was uh, the consideration was my dad had to move in with her. And very few places will even allow that or be set up for a relatively well individual to live with somebody who who needs the kind of care that she needed but financially they needed the you know the sale of their house and all of that kind of stuff yeah. so there's so many circumstances that people are facing and if you're watching this this morning uh and you've got any questions for deb please i'm i'm looking over uh off camera i've got my uh phone set up so that i can see any of the comments or questions that you might have uh, because this is an important conversation. If you're not there yet, you could be. And if only I knew what I discovered after reading Now What, it would have been a much calmer experience overall. It's still an emotional journey though, right? And that's yeah. Well, and as you're describing, I mean, there's where uh, your mom lives in a retirement home. So it's it's fully private pay, retirement yeah. living. And there's all sorts of, there's independent living within retirement living. There is memory care, there's assisted living, all these different levels of care. And then you've got the more of on the government funded side, the long-term care, which yeah. is a much higher acuity level. And so I think one of the challenges is that our healthcare system is already incredibly complex. And most people don't really know much, if anything, about the seniors care uh, sector, which right. is part of, you know, within the healthcare sector. So by the time I find when I talk to families, by the time they're getting to that place and making a decision, they are dealing with a crisis situation. Yeah. Yes. And then they feel like their choices are limited and then they don't know how to navigate through the system. And sometimes they're making decisions without a lot of information. Yeah. Uh, and then that creates friction and frustration at the very beginning of the relationship. I, I tend to liken it that families and staff, when they meet, are really starting in a relational deficit. Mm -hmm. You've got, and I'll just use the my experience with long-term care. And and I I know more than the average person because I worked in the industry for over a decade and I was still blindsided with how much I didn't know. And I already had an advantage there. Yes. Yes. And as a family, you know, you don't you don't really understand what you can ask for, what you can expect. And you want to have that you want to create that balance. I remember we had a little a tiny stumble. I mean, where my mom is, is has been fantastic, really. Uh, but I got a little boom. And one of my sisters was like, you better backtrack that because we don't want to have her kicked out. Like it was like the power dynamic was all of a sudden at play. And uh, that's not the relationship that you want at all. And, yeah. you know, it was a very minor stumble. It was like an insignificant thing, but felt big at the time. And um, so, so now what is your second book? And it's really the book that, it's still a resource for 
the homes, whether that's, you know, retirement home or, or full care, but it's also for the family. Your first book was really geared to the facilities themselves and how they can, they can manage themselves better. Is that, do I have that right? The first book yeah. was really the resource for homes. Yeah, the first book, Recipe for Empathy, Six Strategies to Transform Your Families into Fans and Seniors Care, was exactly that. It was how do we build the empathy and the understanding and recipe is an acronym for six strategies and being able to do that. Uh, and so I do a lot of work with homes and helping to equip and empower staff so that they feel the confidence and the competence to work with families in any situation. Mm -hmm. um, now what uh, I wrote when COVID hit and because I, and I also kept hearing when I was out at homes, I'd have staff and families talking to me about the same situation, but from different perspectives. And I thought I need the families to be have, to be able to have a playbook of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that first of all, let's identify that it is an emotional journey. You're probably dealing with burnout and grief and trauma and all those things that can happen when you have to make this life changing decision. And how do we, equip and empower families as they're stepping into this whole new role that they never imagined that they would ever have to do. Nobody ever says, boy, you know, when, like, when my husband gets old, I can't wait to move him into a long-term care home with a bunch of people that he doesn't know where he can't lock his own door. And, um, and also having people that he doesn't know caring for him, mm -hmm. not something typically that we sign up for. And yet I have such respect and appreciation for the work that people do in seniors care, because it's one of those things that you may not want to have to have it, but you need that support. Yeah. Uh, because there are times when families get to the point where they just cannot continue to provide the, the, the right level of care for their loved one. Yeah. I mean, we'll get into what you call the admission anxiety gaps uh, and have a conversation about that. But yeah, you know, I don't know very much other than what I can sort of Google at different stages. Um, you know, for a long time, sure, my mother was like cuckoo. Uh, and that's sort of, we knew it was dementia. But, you know, when you have that first moment where she looks at you and says, who are you? You know, you're just not prepared as a family for that kind of thing. And, but the staff face it every single day. And so it, you know, it doesn't frighten them. And I think it frightens us out here. The yeah. idea of it beforehand for any of us, I'm sure it, it's a frightening idea, but when it, when it happens, it's, it, it really is, it, even though you, you think you can expect it, it's, it's still a shock. Yeah. It's still a shock. Um, so let's talk about the admission anxiety gaps, because it all starts at the beginning when people are most anxious and fearful and really have probably made a decision that they never, ever wanted to make. Yeah. <clears throat> so what what I really uncovered was this thing called admission anxiety that it's pretty obvious that families would be feeling that admission anxiety that they're coming in, uh, this is not something that they wanted. Uh, and, and I'll speak to three specific gaps that really uh, get in the way of being able to create that clarity and, and comfort. The other thing that's interesting that a lot of people aren't aware of is that staff also feel admission anxiety. So, you know, look at a situation where <clears throat> a resident passes away uh, in most provinces, the expectation is that in long-term care, that that family is moving their loved one's belongings out of that room within 24, maybe 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Because it's a publicly funded system, there's tens of thousands of people on the wait list. In Ontario alone, it's over 40,000 on the wait list. So government needs to get that room turned over. Yeah, And so then there's all of the pieces that the staff are like, first of all, they're, they're likely grieving the loss of that resident who's passed away. I mean, you were talking earlier, your mom's lived at her home for 10 years. It's going to be a big loss for them in those relationships. Mm -hmm. So now the staff are thinking about, okay, we've got a new resident with possibly likely a new family. 
What's the resident going to be like? <clears throat> All of the paperwork that's submitted to outline their circumstances and their conditions. Is it up to date? Is it accurate? A lot of times it's not. Uh, what's the family going to be like? Are they going to be nice? Are they going to be easy to work with? Or are they going to be a challenge? Mm -hmm. and, that, and getting labeled as such. And then the other thing that creates anxiety for staff is that sometimes the admission process itself from the paperwork to getting the room ready to like there's there's all sorts of steps that are involved it's almost like they're trying to duct tape and on a wing and a prayer let's just hope everything goes smoothly i mean a lot of things are outside of their control if the loved one is coming from hospital by ambulance and they're supposed to arrive at 10 they may not get there till two because it's the ambulance schedule so right. there's a lot of unpredictability so when we look at when the family is coming in, there's basically three gaps that I see occur where between educating the families and the care teams is the, the, the best way that you can close these gaps as quickly and efficiently as possible is going to start building that relationship of trust, respect, and partnership. And the first is the knowledge gap. The families come in, they don't know much of anything about the home, the people, processes, policies, protocols, everything about the home, how the system works. Mm -hmm. And the staff, on the other hand, know everything about that. They, they know like their home, like the back of the hand, and they understand how everything works. What they don't know is much about the resident and the family. And I like to say the family dynamics and dysfunctions, because what family doesn't have some dysfunction. Yep. Dysfunction can come into the home when they're dealing in this high stress environment. And so, you know, what I families don't know what they don't know, and it's not their fault. Yeah. So when a family gets a phone call that says your mom's had a fall, and you're like, well, how could that be? You're supposed to be 24 seven one-on-one -on -one care. How could you take your eyes off of my mom? Well, the reality is it's not 24 seven one-on-one -on -one care. There's nope. 24 seven coverage. And it's not the family's fault because sometimes we think, well, how the heck could anybody ever think that that would even be possible? Who'd want to be tethered to another human being for 24 hours a day? Uh, but it's reminding care teams that families don't know what they don't know and it's not their fault. Yeah. So one of the big reasons for writing Now What was to provide education to families. This was my journey and experience. These are the things that's important for you to know. I have 20 misconceptions in that book. And the first one is, I thought my loved one was going to get 24-7 one-on-one care. Mm. But when we can close the knowledge gap and for staff to meet families where they are and clarify what they know, what are their assumptions, what are their narratives about seniors care that they can help to clarify and readjust. Yeah. The second gap is the emotion gap. And it's what we've talked about that families are coming in and a lot of times they're worn out, burned out. They, they're feeling all sorts of guilt about if they were the driver of this decision. And what I say to care team members is you're not just meeting the family, you're meeting their grief. Mm -hmm. And sometimes families, they're not even aware that they're grieving because they're, well, my, my mom, my mom is still here. She hasn't died yet. But the reality is, is that there's been disenfranchised grief. They're mourning the loss of the relationship that they had. And they are probably also mourning the loss of the relationship that will never be. Yeah. because of that change in that person's health status. And you've got the staff who they can't possibly meet the families right there. They would be suffering from compassion, fatigue and burnout. And yet they need to balance that. This is not just another admission in an already busy day. This right. is the biggest day of this family and resident's life. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to close that emotion gap and acknowledge and recognize where the families are and help to create some awareness around that it's completely normal to feel guilty and grieving and feeling relief that you now have help. And then you're feeling guilty that you're feeling relieved. It's a, it's a really messy emotional state that families are in. Yeah. And if, if I can just comment on that from my own experience, our 
the admission itself was actually um, a joyous day, if I can even say that, because my mother was in the hospital for two months and she was now well enough to go home. It would just happen to be a new home. And we got her new outfit and, you know, we greeted her at the door and everybody was lovely. And so it was like, okay, finally, she's in a great place. But at the stage that she's in now, we, my sisters and I had a, a meeting with the home care coordinator talking about, you know, the very sad things and inevitable things. And uh, it was mostly questions about my mother, but she said, you know, are any of you stressed out? And both of my, by, by this, and both of my sisters said, no. I'm like, yes, <laughs> totally. So, you know, you don't, you don't even know where each other really is because you're just so busy. You know, we text each other every day, you know, who saw her? What was she like? What was she doing? Did she eat? Blah, 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 blah. And you're, you're so much on the, I don't know, the tactics of the, of the experience at this point, and you don't take time to kind of talk about the emotions. Yeah. So it, that's very interesting. We're not always all there at the same time, and we don't know what each other is is going to experience in that moment, whether it's gonna be a little, oh, there was a spark, or oh, no, kind of thing. So I would say it's all the, over the place. There's also comfort in doing the tactical because you feel productive and useful and you're moving the ball down the field, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, and I found that when I was managing all of Ty's specialist appointments, I mean, I felt like I was really making things happen. Mm -hmm. but it also was a, a coping mechanism to uh, like Lisa Simpson, I would say on the Simpsons, push those emotions so far down right to your toes because it's hard to deal with that. Yeah. And unfortunately what happens is that that grief can come out in what I would describe as disproportionate reaction. So sometimes, you know, you had mentioned earlier about it was a little situation when you look back on it now, but at the time it was a big deal for you. Yeah. And you may not have had the emotional bandwidth to really step back and assess and calm yourself and look at the facts and try to be pragmatic about it. We have this immediate emotional reaction. And part of that is fueled by a lot of the negative narratives around uh, seniors care mm -hmm. uh, and also just that that giving up what I would say would be we would see as the control, which kind of leads into the third gap, which is the identity gap. And that's where, I mean, I never, I didn't realize that my role changed in a moment when we moved Ty in and I became part of this relational triangle. And that relational triangle is Ty is the resident and my loved one at the top, mm -hmm. it's care members in the home. And then me as a family member, because before I was calling all the shots, I was pulling all the levers and I could be a bit of a control freak. So I was managing everything, not realizing it was completely burning me out. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I have this team of people who are going to be making decisions and providing care that I don't have any involvement or say or influence over. Mm -hmm. And Ty's role has changed, too, because now he's become a resident living in a community setting with other people. So that's all changed for him. Mm -hmm. What I tend to say is that to families, you're not giving up control of your loved one's care. You're taking on a new role as a partner in care. Mm. It sounds subtle, but that's the thing I find that families will say to me, I never thought of it that way. I was going in driving. I had this one family member, Shirley. She says, I was driving the staff crazy. I was saying, you're not taking care of my mom the way that I do. You're not doing it the right way and constantly poking holes and, and was driving the staff crazy. And then she said, after reading now what and realizing that the staff need time to learn about my mom, mm -hmm. her likes and dislikes and how to best work with her. It was like, yes, they were providing different kind of care, but it wasn't any worse. It was just different. Right. And being able to let go of that. And uh, I think sometimes families put so much pressure on themselves. And, you know, I'm not sure, like you were saying, you've got a schedule with your sisters. Um, some people, you know, families feel like they need to be there every single day. And I really encourage them to think about what's driving that. Is it, 
is it truly that this this brings you joy to spend so much like to to be there so frequently and spend time or is there something that you're not trusting or really try to dig down into what is the emotion that's driving your behavior in this yeah that's interesting a friend of mine had a a father who was in long term care for quite some time and she had two siblings like i do and they literally had shifts and they were sort of acting as nursing care almost, but he was in a facility. And, uh, you know, it's only recently that because we're edging close uh, to end of life in our situation that we're, that we're kind of going in They're short visits, but, um, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, in the, in the earlier times, I, uh, I mean, my parents were there together, so that, that's rare. So won't talk about that. But after the kind of initial grief of losing my father um, started to normalize, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Uh, we went back to a more normal routine as well, because it really is her care workers who know how to look after her and know what she needs. And I've been there and I've been in the way Mm -hmm. and, you know, stood in the hallway for half an hour and thought, well, maybe I should have asked what the best time was. So you figure all those things out, but I think that's really important. Um, We've only got three minutes left. There's so much more that we could talk about. Uh, But as I like to say, go buy the book. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, and you know, I, I'm, I said this morning, I haven't got my, my replacement copy. I gave my copy away, uh, to somebody who was starting to look at the process of moving their parents into long-term care. And they were so appreciative of the material. I wish that I'd had it in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're, if you're thinking that this is, even a little bit close, uh, or you know somebody who is approaching that stage. It's just such a, it's a great read. You tell a beautiful personal story, but it's so, there's so much content and so much to really contemplate and think about that might not take all the anxiety away, uh, but might have you feel a little bit calmer. So, um, so, to let people know how to get in touch with you. It's Deborah at DebraBakti.com. And of course, if you go to DebraBakti.com, you will be able to buy the book there, but you can also buy it straight off of Amazon, uh, amazon amazon.ca, amazon.com, wherever you are. uh, It's easily and readily available. So I highly recommend it. And there's an audio book that people can access on my website as well. Um, And I think it's important to note, it's basically a two hour read cover to cover. I designed it to be an easy read. You don't have to read it all in one sitting, but it's, uh, it's not a massive novel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It really is a work, almost like a, it's not a workbook, but it's kind of like a, a a very practical, usable book. Yeah. Deb, thank you so much again for being here. It's always great to connect with you over the years for all kinds of things, but especially to have this conversation this morning, I really, really appreciate you coming and everybody who was here. um, Thank you for being here. And uh, this will be ready for replay immediately on LinkedIn, uh, but it will also be uploaded to YouTube Uh, if there's anything that you want to go back and listen to in a little bit deeper sense. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Deb. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye for now.